Hello everyone. On this week's Energy Quick Chat, we speak to Ellison Karuhanga, an energy law expert and a partner at Uganda-based independent law firm, Kampala Associated Advocates. Thank you for speaking with us on Energy Quick Chat, sir. Thank you, Omono. It is an honor and a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Good. To start us off, can you give a brief breakdown of the East African crude oil pipeline law that was passed in 2021? In 2021, Uganda passed the East African, the ECOP, East African Crude Oil Pipeline Special Provisions Act. The act brought into law a number of things. One, it enshrined the rights of landowners. Two, it domesticated um, and, and introduced many of the treaty provisions. In order to build the pipeline, Uganda had entered into a treaty with Tanzania, an intergovernment agreement. Uganda and Tanzania had also entered into separate host government agreements with the developers, with the project developers. And so it was agreed that um, many of the provisions of those agreements would be incorporated within um, a, a law together with issues to do with land rights and together with the resolution of many of the controversial issues that may surround the project. So the ECOP Special Provisions Act seems to do with even, even tax harmonization between Uganda and Tanzania. So the ECOP Special Provisions Act um, of 2021 was therefore a law brought in to bring harmony to the process of um, building and constructing East African Crude Oil Pipeline, and also to bring harmony between the provisions of the laws in Uganda and Tanzania. Tanzania also passed a similar act in Tanzania. Therefore, we have a treaty with Tanzania, and with the Tanzanian and Ugandan governments have agreements with developers to develop this project, and both of us have been able to domesticate our treaties and um, at the same time have uh, a proper agreements in place and governed by a proper legal framework. So why is this pipeline a critical project? The East African crude oil pipeline is, you, well, is a critical project for Uganda because it opens up the Ugandan oil fields. Uganda discovered oil some 1,400 kilometers away from the nearest coastline in a place which at that time was um, a very remote area uh, along the Albertine Graben, near the border with the Congo and uh, all the way from the western part of the country to the northern part of the country. And as these oil fields began to stretch along the country, very many rural areas, a lot of infrastructure had to be created. One of the things that has to be created for the commercialization of this oil is the East African crude oil pipeline. This pipeline will be able to take Uganda's crude oil to international markets. Uganda will also be building a refinery. Uganda currently consumes 30,000 barrels of oil per day. Uh, the refinery's capacity will be 60,000 barrels of oil per day, targeting Uganda and parts of the East African region as its market. However, the oil will be producing is 250,000 barrels per day. There will therefore be excess oil and uh, a lot more oil will have to be exported as crude because it cannot be utilized within the region. And uh, ECOP therefore allows for the commercialization of the oil fields and the commercialization of our refinery and the commercialization of the, Uganda, of the entire Uganda oil project. The second important value of ECOP is that it opens a second route to the sea for Uganda. Uganda mainly relies on the route towards the east with uh, in Kenya. With, with a new port at Tanga that has been built, with a pipeline that will be connecting us to the port in Tanga, we have not just a new route to the sea, but a massive opportunity for a reverse gas pipeline from Tanzania to help power up the Ugandan industry. Not only is that an advantage, we also have an incredible opportunity to create a to create a trade route which didn't exist before. Already, I think a study by the African Development Bank 
is being undertaken and has established that there are a number of new businesses that have risen up just along the pipeline corridor. So we are creating a new trade route, we are creating a new economic center in this country. 80% uh, of our GDP is located in our capital. We are right now creating a, a new business place. There is an industrial park that's coming up. Already um, an international airport is being constructed and is 70% complete within the oil region. Um, we are seeing um, an opportunity. The East African crude oil pipeline is important because it helps to commercialize an incredible opportunity for the people of Uganda and for the people of East Africa. It's important for East Africa because we should still use the port of Mombasa to mainly import a lot of the product and a lot of the substance, a lot of the equipment for the construction of ECOP. So ECOP would rely entirely on the Kenyan port of Mombasa. The oil would rely entirely on the Tanzanian port of Tanga. And therefore, this is an East African project in the sense that it cannot work without Kenya, it cannot work without Tanzania, and it creates a new route, a new trade route, incredible opportunities from Mombasa to Tanga, uh, and so it is an important project in that regard. Okay. Uh, now that you talk about the people of Uganda, um, the European Parliament uh, recently said that uh, the pipeline is going to infringe on people's rights. What is your opinion on that? With the greatest of respect, I think the European Parliament did not conduct any serious research before coming to the conclusion that it came to. How can opportunity be a problem? As we speak right now in Europe, we are seeing a big problem with energy, which problem has affected the whole world. We are seeing a massive increase in the price of energy. We are seeing a return in Europe to massive investments in fossil fuels. We are seeing sanctions being lifted against Russia to allow gas turbines to come from Canada. To allow gas turbines to come from Canada. We are seeing, um, we are seeing uh, Nord Stream 1 being repaired. We are seeing uh, pipelines being reactivated between France and Germany. We are seeing drilling by 53 new licenses being issued in the North Sea. We are seeing the start of new oil activity in the UK continental shelf. I think the European Parliament, if it is so interested in fighting fossil fuels, has a lot of things to do in the European background, other than coming here to stop us from transition. The transition they have in mind for us is a transition from darkness to darkness. At the moment, if you're talking about the rights of individuals, the laws of Uganda provide sufficient and adequate protection to people who are affected by this project. Secondly, the Uganda government and its partners, and the Tanzanian government and its partners, are using what we call IFC performance standards. IFC is International Financial Corporation, which is um, the lending arm of the World Bank. And the standards are very simple. Prompt, adequate, and fair compensation before anybody is deprived of his land. In the case of Uganda, much and Tanzania, much of what is happening is being done on a willing buyer, willing seller basis. No activity will be undertaken until someone has been fully compensated. If you checked on the social media platforms of many in this country, you'd see a lot of replacement houses have been built. People are moving from huts to houses. And so we are dealing without doubt with a project that has taken a long time, a very long time to come from from paper, from thin paper to thick action because yeah. a lot of time has been taken to mitigate against these risks. We do not need lectures from the European Parliament to tell Ugandans how to treat Ugandans. I am sure Ugandans prefer Ugandans. And I am sure the government and people and people in charge in Uganda are a lot more comfortable with, um, with, uh, with working with ourselves than with being dictated to by people who, have, who come to Uganda for four days, three days to do an investigation and become experts. I, I, I don't want to be very harsh in my language, but I want to say very respectfully, the days of Carl Peters, David Livingstone, Henry Morton Stanley, and Frederick Lugard ended in the 1880s. 
you cannot come to Africa for four days and become an expert European MP or not. Right. So let's move on to the next question. Environmentalists are actively fighting against ECOP. What happens if they seek legal backing? They have sought, they have been to court. They have been to court okay. in Uganda. They have been to court in the East African Court of Justice that sits in Arusha. Okay. They have been to court in Paris, of course. They wouldn't miss that. They'll probably be in London. They'll probably be in Washington as well. We, I think the important thing is to continue to put our case. It's, it's so sad that we have to defend developing our countries. It's so sad that we have to defend fighting for the improvement of the lives of our people. I think this is now a constant for every African project that's going to have to come up, and it's just something we just have to do. So um, there, there have been applications for injunctions in the courts in Uganda, which applications were not successful. There are applications currently in Paris. There are applications in the court in Tanzania, in Arusha, um, in the East African Court of Justice. The East African community has a supranational court that superintends over the six states of East Africa in accordance with the Treaty of East Africa, and we are seeing cases in the East African Court of Justice. The litigation is still ongoing. It's part of life. We will just have to fight that litigation and defend the right of our countries to develop. Good. So what will be the impact of Kenya's fuel subsidy removal on Uganda's fuel supply going forward? There will be no direct impact. Kenya operates on what, what is called the OTS, which is the Open Tender System. And under this system, oil marketing companies are able to bring fuel from wherever they bring it from, mainly from the, the Middle East, Singapore, and um, the parts of the Far East. They bring the oil into Kenya, and uh, they bring the oil into Kenya, and then Kenya allocates the oil within Kenya, and the balance goes into the hinterland, which is Uganda, South Sudan, uh, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, Burundi. What the Kenyan subsidy did was it made the hinterland more attractive for many oil marketing companies because, of course, of the inefficiency of subsidy. What would happen is that the government would take a long time to pay the subsidy. So many of these companies prefer to sell their oil at its high prices to neighboring countries. The removal of the subsidy may make Kenya more attractive and may slightly reduce from the availability of product uh, in the secondary market. But this is something that um, is a very low risk item. We've been having fuel through the subsidy. We've been having fuel without the subsidy. Yes, we work very closely with that and depend very strongly on the Kenyan Ministry of Energy for whatever product comes in here. And, and this is why it's important for, for us in East Africa to develop our own projects, to develop a project that will be able to refine in Uganda and provide that fuel on that tender system to Kenya. And uh, I think the argument is between producing our oil or importing their oil. Uh, that's the only choice. It is a choice between fighting poverty and conserving poverty. There's nothing environmental about it. And what we are seeing in Kenya is, is exactly what it is. Kenya has been a brother towards Uganda or a sister towards Uganda in, the, in this respect. And uh, the subsidy, the, their subsidization of their fuel, even if it led to fuel shortages within Kenya, it did not necessarily affect us. And I'm sure that... Um, the removal of the subsidy will also not affect us. Great. Okay. okay. So some banks have been asked to pull back funding from ECOP. What is being done to reverse this? ECOP will get funding. It's a viable project. And there are banks all over the world. From There was a time when there were banks when the financial institution was concentrated in one place on earth. But right now, the globe is big from China to Japan to India to Mexico to Nigeria to wherever. We, we will be able to get funding. The, the, the push to stop financing, to stop ECOP or financial support, though, is a strong move and it's a move that we have to resist um, on this side. And the only way we can resist it is by providing the correct information. I am confident, though. 
that ECOP will be properly subscribed. We are seeing activities already along the ECOP route. We are seeing people can be in uh, discussions happening. We are seeing a lot of compensation occurring. We are seeing the conclusion of um, replacement houses, of replacement houses. We are seeing a lot of work, and so I'm confident that the way the work is going, uh, we are we are confident that there will be adequate budget financing. In fact, I would, I wouldn't be surprised if ECOP is even oversubscribed by financiers. Okay. Uh, well. Thank you so much for that insightful conversation. And we thank you so much for your time here on Energy Quick Chats. Alison Karuhanga, energy law expert and partner at Uganda-based independent law firm, Kampala Associated Advocates. I am Omano Okumpo. See you next time on Energy Quick Chats, where we speak to leaders from the energy sector.